Paul Graham is a professional billionaire scout. Similar to how a professional sports scout actively seeks out the next Cristiano Ronaldo or LeBron James, Paul Graham looks for and grooms future billionaires. And his remarkable track record speaks for itself. Since launching Y Combinator in 2005, Paul and YC have funded over 4,000 companies, many of which are now household names, with at least 90 companies valued at over a billion dollars. Paul has successfully mentored and guided the likes of Brian Chesky, Tony Hsu, Sam Altman, the Colson brothers, and Brian Armstrong. When it comes to making as much money as possible in the shortest possible time, there's no better person to study and learn from than Paul Graham. He has discovered the most reliable path to becoming a billionaire, with a data set on wealth creation that is unrivaled. I've been a fan of his writing for years, and in this video I share what I learned from reading three of his incredible essays on wealth creation and how to become a billionaire. I can remember believing as a child that if a few rich people had all the money, it left less for everyone else. Many people seem to continue to believe something like this well into adulthood. This fallacy is usually there in the background when you hear someone talking about how X percent of the population have Y percent of the wealth. What leads people astray here is the abstraction of money. Money is not wealth, it's just something we use to move wealth around. So although there may be, in certain specific moments, like your family this month, a fixed amount of money available to trade with other people for things you want, there is not a fixed amount of wealth in the world. You can make more wealth. Wealth has been getting created and destroyed, but on balance created for all of human history. That's Paul Graham reflecting on what he calls the pie fallacy, the false belief that the total amount of wealth in the world is fixed. But it's not fixed. We can always create more of it if we want to. He eloquently explains this using the example of a used car. Let's say you own a beat up old car. Instead of sitting on your butt and watching TV all summer, you can spend the time restoring your car to pristine condition. In doing so, you're creating wealth. Through your work, the world has become one pristine car richer, and so have you. If you sell the car now, you'll get more money for it. And here's the important part, you haven't made anyone else poorer as a result. So there's obviously not a fixed pie, we can actually grow the pie. Every year since 1982, Forbes magazine has published a list of America's wealthiest people. If we compared the 100 richest people in 1982 to the 100 richest today, we noticed some big differences. In 1982, 84% of the wealthiest people got rich by inheritance, extracting natural resources or doing some real estate deals. So how are people getting their fortunes today? Roughly 75% by starting the companies and 25% by investing. Of the 73 new fortunes in 2020, 56 derived from founders or early employees equity and 17 from managing investment funds. It's no surprise that Paul is a big advocate of startups, but what is it that makes founding a company such a compelling path to wealth in such a short period of time? According to Paul, it's all about the intensity of work. He writes, Economically, you can think of a startup as a way to compress your whole working life into a few years. Instead of working at a low intensity for 40 years, you work as hard as you possibly can for 4 years. If you want to make a million dollars, you have to endure a million dollars worth of pain. For example, one way to make a million dollars would be to work for the post office your whole life and save every penny of your salary. Imagine the stress of working for the post office for 50 years. In a startup, you compress all this stress into three or four years. Almost everyone wants to be wealthy, but few are willing to work to the point of exhaustion, where you not only have zero leisure time, but are working so hard that you endanger your health. They teach you how to do this in some careers, like investment banking, which is why I think banking is one of the best places for young people to start their careers, but society as a whole doesn't teach us how to work this way. We're expected to slog through our careers at an average level of intensity. Paul writes that a startup is an economically way of saying, I want to work faster. Instead of accumulating money slowly by being paid a regular wage, age for 50 years, I want to get it over with as soon as possible. So do we have to be startup founders to work this way? Not necessarily, but according to Paul, we have to put ourselves in an environment where our performance can be measured and where the decisions we make have a big impact. He refers to these two critical factors as measurement and leverage. I think everyone who gets rich by their own efforts will be found to be in a situation with measurement and leverage. Everyone I can think of does. CEOs, movie stars, hedge fund managers, professional athletes. A good hint to the presence of leverage is the possibility of failure. Upside must be balanced by downside. So if there is a big potential for gain, there must also be a terrifying possibility of loss. CEOs, stars, fund managers, and athletes all live with a sword hanging over their heads. The moment they start to suck, they're out. If you're in a job that feels safe, you are not going to get rich. Because if there is no danger, there is almost certainly no leverage. That last part is so important. If there is no danger, there is almost certainly no leverage. 
This reminds me of Naval's idea of accountability. The more I study Paul Graham, the more I realize how similar his and Naval's ideas are. Naval argues that we should embrace accountability and take business risks under our own name. If we don't create things under our own name, whether that's our startup or our YouTube channel, we can't build credibility. We have to risk failure and humiliation. While this is often scary, it's not as bad as it used to be back in the day. Naval writes that, Luckily, in modern society, there's no more debtor's prison, and people aren't imprisoned or executed for losing other people's money, but we're still socially hardwired to not fail in public under our own names. The people who have the ability to fail in public under their own names actually gain a lot of power. Naval's notion of accountability and Paul's idea of measurement and leverage are very difficult to find while working for a big company. Why? Well, at a big company, you're just a cog, and everyone's effort sort of just blends together and averages out. It's a lot harder to stand out. At a small company, it's much easier to measure the work you've done and the impact you've had. Paul drives this point home using an example of rowers. A big company is like a giant galley driven by a thousand rowers. Two things keep the speed of the galley down. One is that individual rowers don't see any result from working harder. The other is that in a group of a thousand people, the average rower is likely to be pretty average. If you took 10 people at random out of the big galley and put them in a boat by themselves, they could probably go faster. They would have both carrot and stick to motivate them. An energetic rower would be encouraged by the thought that he could have a visible effect on the speed of the boat. And if someone was lazy, the others would be more likely to notice and complain. But the real advantage of the 10-man boat shows when you take the 10 best rowers out of the big galley and put them in a boat together. They will have all the extra motivation that comes from being in a small group. But more importantly, by selecting that a small group, you can get the best rowers. Each one will be in the top 1%. It's a much better deal for them to average their work together with a small group of their peers than to average it with everyone. So if you want to become rich quick, you have to work at an early stage startup. You don't have to be the founder, although that's of course great, but you have to put yourself in a situation where you have a group of other people who also want to work harder and get paid more than they would at a big company. At a big company, you can't really walk up to your boss and say, hey, I feel like working 10 times harder. Can you please pay me 10 times more? <laughs> For one, they're already expecting that you're working as hard as you can. And two, big companies have no direct way of measuring the value of your work unless you're in top management or a sales role where your impact is more measurable, of course. This imbalance between how hard you work and how much you get paid for that work creates a unique opportunity for founders and early startup employees. Big companies can, of course, develop technology, but their size makes them slow, and it prevents them from rewarding employees for the extraordinary effort required to solve hard problems. And so Paul argues that we should actively seek out these hard problems. Use difficulty as a guide, not just in selecting the overall aim of your company, but also at decision points along the way. At ViaWeb, one of our rules of thumb was run upstairs. Suppose you are a little, nimble guy chased by a big, fat bully. You open a door and find yourself in a staircase. Do you go up or down? I say up. The bully can probably run downstairs as fast as you can. Going upstairs, his bulk will be more of a disadvantage. Running upstairs is hard for you, but even harder for him. I absolutely love that metaphor, and it's an excellent reminder of the importance of building products with high barriers of entry. Paul is such a good writer, so I have to throw in another one here to really emphasize the point. If there were two features we could add to our software, both equally valuable in proportion to their difficulty, we'd always take the harder one. Not just because it was more valuable, but because it was harder. We delighted in forcing bigger, slower competitors to follow us over difficult ground. Like guerrillas, startups prefer the difficult terrain of the mountains where the troops of the central government can't follow. I can remember times when we were just exhausted after wrestling all day with some horrible technical problem, and I'd be delighted because something that was hard for us would be impossible for our competitors. This reminds me of Peter Thiel's concept of zero to one. Most progress in the world is simply copying or iterating on something that's already been done before, which is going from one to n. But true innovation happens when we go from nothing to something, when we go from zero to one. This can only happen by solving hard problems. But in order to create wealth, we also have to make something people want. This is so important that it's literally YC slogan. And it feels stupidly obvious. Of course, we have to create products that people actually want to buy. But creating something that people want is much harder than we might initially think. Paul goes, In a market economy, it's hard to make something people want that they don't already have. That's the great thing about market economies. If other people both knew about this need and were able to satisfy it, they already would be, and there would be no room for your startup. Again, this reminds me of Naval, where he says that to become rich, you have to give society what it wants, but doesn't yet know how to get at scale. 
If society knew how to get it, it wouldn't need you. Okay, so let's say we do everything that Paul asks of us. We quit our big corporate jobs, we launched or joined an early stage startup, solved hard problems and made something people want. Then what? Let's hear it from Paul. One thing few people realize about billionaires is that all of them could have stopped sooner. They could have gotten acquired or found someone else to run the company. Many founders do. The ones who become really rich are the ones who keep working. And what makes them keep working is not just money. What keeps them working is the same thing that keeps anyone else working when they could stop if they wanted to, that there's nothing else they would rather do. We see this in founders such as Brian Chesky, Daniel Eyck, Mark Zuckerberg, and Brian Armstrong to name a few. They're still running the companies they founded despite going public years ago. Building companies is the most reliable way to become wealthy and it's not going to change anytime soon. Paul Graham's mentee Sam Altman has taken this to heart and has valuable lessons to share with us as well. Check out this next video where I break down Sam's incredible essay, How to Be Successful. Hope you found some value here. If you did, hit subscribe and I'll see you next time.